Thanks very much, Katie. Um, and thank you everyone for, for coming along and choosing <laughs> choosing this session. I, I would probably have chosen one of the other ones. Um, there's so much great stuff going on alongside each other, um, but really appreciate coming along. And hopefully for those of you who are in Bristol or the Southwest of England, at least, it's a very hot day. So I'm hoping some Antarctic um, history can, can cool, cool you down a little bit um, and, and play a role in that. So this, um, this talk, came out of a, a dissertation I wrote last year um, as part of the Christian Rural and Environmental Studies course um, that is run by Martin and Margot Hodson um, through the John Ray Initiative and um, based at Ripon College, Cuddleston. And it's, it's a really good course. And if anyone's interested in sort of deepening uh, an understanding of Christianity and the environment, religion and the environment, I, I really recommend um, looking into that and potentially taking taking the course. Um, but this was sort of the, the dissertation um, that I, I wrote for, for that. And the reason I chose that was I was looking for ways to try and connect my academic um, work as an environmental historian of the polar regions with my religious faith um, and sort of the journey into, into ministry um, as, a, as an ordinand at, at Serum, Serum College. So, The, um, my Antarctic work um, takes place um, in different parts of the Antarctic continent, but recently I've been working in a place called the McMurdo Dry Valleys, which is the, the largest ice-free region of, of Antarctica. And this was some work we did a couple of years ago um, to use historical photos to try and identify sites where there were um, former field camps, and then go back to those sites and resample, or to sam sample the soils and see if we could see any trace of lasting human impacts from where um, field camps have, have been. So trying to use history in a way to, to inform the, the scientific work um, that's going on there. Um, as, as Casey mentioned, I've also been involved in the, the hazelnut uh, community, which is proving a really great way to sort of combine the, the religious faith and, um, and the environment. I could probably have done a slightly better job with this, with this reef photography effort, but uh, these are our raised beds in the, the Hawfield sites. And the, the picture on the right has our first plantings of garlic. Um, I, th I think they're still alive and, and doing okay. Um, but this is the work that we're doing um, in, in Hawfield. So it struck me um, as I was putting this talk together that in some ways, these are two very different contexts. Um, how does um, the work in Antarctica relate to um, the hazelnut community um, farm here in, in Bristol. But just as an example, in, in the dry valleys, there's no plants at all. Even the, there's debate about whether the soils classify as, as soils because there's so little organic um, matter in, in, the, in the soils. But I think one of the main points I want to get across in my talk this afternoon is, is that I think there's a real value in looking across um, scales at environmental issues and sort of environmental theology and the history of religion and the, the environment. So I, I want to sort of think about two questions as we move through um, the talk. Uh, the first one, what role can religious faith play in addressing the environmental challenges facing Antarctica in the 21st century? And I think deliberately there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance. So wh where does, in, where does uh, religion even start in, in addressing this issue? But that's something I think important for us to think about. And then the second question flips that round and asks, how can thinking about the history of religion and the environment in Antarctica help us to think about environmental challenges closer to home in places like uh, Hawfield in Bristol or wherever we might be uh, located in our, our local contexts? So I want to present very briefly just some of the ideas uh, that I've been exploring um, in this in this dissertation and in my in my wider work. Um, but I really want to leave lots of time for questions. I can't actually see the chat at the moment, um, so I, I won't be looking at that. But I'll as soon as I'm done, I'll, I'll shut this down and, and open the um, the chat to get the question. So I would really appreciate any sort of comments, any questions, any ways to address um, the, these questions. Um, particularly things that you might think would be good to take this forward. I'm hoping to continue with this, with this work and this research. So if you have suggestions, that would be really, um, really appreciated. <laughs> 
And I, I also realize I'm trying to cover a lot of ground very quickly. So if, if there's any content questions, please ask those as well um, at the end. So the idea of Antarctica as a secular continent draws on the philosopher Charles Taylor's idea of living in a secular age in which being religious has become a choice in a way that it wasn't, let's say 500 years ago. Um, everyone had sort of a religious mentality um, then and today there's a choice. And in thinking about Antarctica as a secular continent, um, I think there's lots of ways to, to do this, to think about this. Um, there's no indigenous population in the Antarctic, unlike the Arctic in the other, the other image here. Uh, so there's no indigenous religion. Um, all the human history has taken place in the last 200 years. Um, so in what Charles Taylor would call the, the secular age, the sort of enlightenment, um, this period when religious faith has been a, a choice for many people in the West. There are no cathedrals. Um, there's no sort of traditional religious pilgrimage sites in, in Antarctica. And it's often referred to as a continent for science. So science is the dominant human activity taking place on the Antarctic continent. But just because it's a secular continent doesn't mean that religion doesn't matter. And I think that there's some really interesting ways that religion influences the history of Antarctica that sometimes get overlooked, but can be useful for us thinking about bigger questions for environmental theology. So, um, I won't say too much about the sort of the, the sort of overview of, of Antarctica, um, but the, the both polar regions are characterized by intense seasonality. So the polar circles in both north and south are the places at which north of which or south of which in Antarctica there is at least one day when it's fully when the sun never sets and one day when the sun never rises. So very intensely seasonal. Um, some similarities of geography between North and South, but obvious differences as well. Most importantly, in the Arctic, there are um, indigenous populations who have been living there for thousands of years. So the Arctic is, is very much not the secular um, continent that I'll be talking about for Antarctica. But both of these places, as an environmental historian, I like them because you can't avoid the environment. Um, I challenge my students at the University of Bristol to find any book written about the Arctic or Antarctica that doesn't mention the environment. And it's almost impossible, but because of this sort of extreme environment, um, it's, it's there and invisible. This is a picture of McMurdo Station. This is the, the largest town <laughs> in, in Antarctica and probably doesn't quite conform to our image of what Antarctica should look like or does look like. Um, but it gives some idea of the human impacts on the continent. Uh, this is a, a US station. I think at the height of summer, you sometimes get about 2000 people living, living in Antarctica. And I've had the opportunity to go down a couple of times to, to McMurdo and it's, it's a really interesting community. But again, sort of thinking about human impacts and, and what is, what is the, the impact of science on the environment in the Antarctic. So I'll go through these uh, three sections um, fairly quickly. Um, first of all, I want to take us back 100 years and look at religion and the so-called heroic era of Antarctic exploration. Um, some of you might have seen this iconic image of Captain Scott at the South Pole. This is the 17th of January, 1912. The British explorers got there to find that the um, Norwegians had beaten them to the, to the South Pole by over a month. And you can sort of see the, the disappointment on their faces and none of these five men would make it back um, alive. They would all perish on the return journey from the, from the South Pole. A particularly interesting person in terms of religion and the heroic era is actually Edward Wilson, the guy on the sitting down on the right, the right hand side. Um, he was the chief scientist on the, on the expedition. Um, really interesting um, background biography. He grew up in Cheltenham, um, attended Cheltenham College, was really influenced by the evangelical Christianity um, of the college in the late 19th century, uh, but really um, combined, he, he went on to become a, um, or to st study medicine at Cambridge and became a physician, but was also interested in botany. And um, his heroes were St. Francis Assisi and Charles Darwin. And I think it's really important to see how religion and, and science, um, th there was no contradiction in the minds of, of people like um, Wilson 
in the early 20th um, century, late 19th, early 20th century. But this mentality, this sort of religious mentality helps to explain, I think, some of the, the passion and the urge to get to the South Pole and the, the sort of the, the, the culture of the heroic era. Religion played a major role in that that I think often goes unacknowledged. Um, <laughs> he was a much better scientist than he was a poet, so I won't read, read this out. Um, but there's, particularly in the second column, there's some ideas that, that it's sort of God's, God's destiny or it's the, the English um, expedition's destiny to uncover the, the secrets of, of this, this, this continent and it's sort of the privilege of the British to, to be the ones doing that. So religious language is being used. There are some colonial connotations in this. This is the age, of course, of the, the sort of the high point of the British Empire. Um, and religion is at the heart of, of the way they are viewing, or at least the way Wilson in, in, is viewing um, the Antarctic. So I can go into more detail in any questions you have, but I just want to sort of suggest that it's, it's fundamental in the early history of the Antarctic continent and the history of um, exploration. Religion is very much there. The second section looks at religion and geopolitics in, in a continent for, for science. Um, and moving to, to Latin America, um, it's, it's quite interesting the way that uh, both Chile and Argentina make sovereignty claims to, to Antarctica that actually overlap with the, the claims made by Britain uh, to what is now the, the British Antarctic Territory. But in making these claims, um, both South American countries used religion as a, as a way of sort of enforcing or demonstrating their claims to Antarctic Territory. Um, this, this man on the left, um, some of you might recognize him, Juan Domingo Perón. Um, his wife was probably more famous, uh, Evita. Uh, but he was instrumental in pushing Argentine sovereignty claims to, to Antarctica. But one of the arguments that Argentina used was that the, um, their claim goes back to the papal bull of 1493, which divided the world between Spanish and Portuguese spheres of influence. So drawing on this sort of religious um, papal ruling um, to make the claim to, to Antarctica. And then in, um, on the 20th of February, 1946, the first Catholic mass was held in Antarctica at an Argentine station. Um, a eight meter cross was, was hoisted at the station and the Pope was contacted by telegram from Antarctica to tell him that the, uh, the mass had, had taken place. So using religion in a sense, mixing the religion and the environment to, to make national claims. And uh, anything that Argentina could do, Chile could do better. So in 1969, I think the, the Chileans built a, a, a large station on King George Island. And at the heart of that was this chapel, um, the um, yeah, Santa Maria Reina de la Paz uh, chapel that sort of domesticated this landscape um, using, using religion at, at the heart of it. And so religion and environment mixes, I, it's a beautiful building. Um, and it really struck me as I was preparing this talk, how the building sort of mirrors the landscape um, and fits into to the Antarctic uh, sort of the ice and the hills around, around it. The Americans um, have also got a chapel in, in Antarctica that actually looks uncannily similar from the outside to the, to the Chilean station. This is a, um, a, a church I've been to a couple of times and is really interesting to, to visit. Um, this beautiful stained glass window in the bottom left. Um, and there's some really interesting stories about religion and, and um, or religious experiences among American explorers and logistics staff and scientists in the Antarctic. One of the most famous is probably Admiral Richard Byrd who in the 1930s spent a year or tried to spend a winter on his own on the, um, on the ice sheet and his sort of religious musings were published. In, I think I, I froze then, am I back? Yeah, um, so this sort of, this, this encounter with God that um, Bird had um, in, in Antarctica is, is, is just a sort of a, an interesting story. But the overarching, um, in, in terms of religion and geopolitics, I would argue that America, 
and many other countries, probably including, including Britain, have actually tried to move away from thinking about religion in, in the Antarctic to making the continent a continent for science, to the extent at which we, we, we largely overlook the religious history of, of Antarctica now in favor of its scientific history. Science is seen as something that brings countries together and promotes peace, whereas religion potentially had the um, potential to cause, to cause conflict. So the Antarctic Treaty that was signed in Washington DC on the 1st of December, 1959, was this continent for science and religion was sort of shunted away and, and hidden, I would argue, um, by, this, by this treaty. And then the final section just looks at, a little bit at sort of the contemporary issues in, in Antarctica, secular wilderness. Um, and a couple of years ago, February 2019, um, the Argentine military bishop, um, Santiago Oliveira, visited um, Antarctica. And you can see from the size of the flags that nationalism is still part of this, part of this visit. But his actual, his, his real focus was on creation care and particularly on climate change. And so in, in South America is, is this sort of, some of the things we're talking about at this conference are, are, are coming, coming to um, be quite prominent as well in, um, in their dealings with, with the Antarctic. As, as you probably know, Antarctica over the last 50 or 60 years has really become one of the, the sort of the front lines of both the science of climate change and the consequences of, of climate change, um, thinking about the um, correlations uh, between carbon dioxide and, and high temperatures in the Earth's climatic history, using ice cores from Antarctica, but also the, the vulnerability of, of Antarctic ice. So how stable is the East Antarctic ice sheet? How stable is the West Antarctic ice sheet? Probably quite a bit more unstable. And it's estimated that if all of the ice in Antarctica were to melt, global sea levels would increase um, by about 60 meters. So catastrophic. Um, global sea level rise uh, potentially caused by melting, melting ice in Antarctica. So really have become a focus of um, anthropogenic climate change and the sort of the vulnerability of the, the earth to human actions. One of the things I think is really interesting is the, the way that um, Antarctica is now trying, or the global community is trying to protect um, Antarctica as best as they can. And I think words like wilderness um, that are now actually enshrined into the text or into a protocol of the Antarctic Treaty give opportunities for overlapping the, the religious, um, the theology, theological perspectives and the, the science. Um, so I, I won't say too much about that, but maybe pick that up in the, um, in the chat. But there's a lot of discussion about what, what constitutes wilderness in, in Antarctica. I, I took this picture of a scientific um, study site um, with some scientific equipment. And there was a big debate, is this still, does this, does this mean this is no longer wilderness because it's being studied? And I think the experience of quite a few of the scientists who go down to Antarctica is actually akin to the um, Israelites wandering in the wilderness or Jesus um, being tempted um, in the wilderness. And this kind of going and learning about yourself and going and learning about the world and bringing that back, um, bringing that experience back is sort of language that we can, that we share with, with science in, in Antarctica. So just going back to the, the, the questions I started with, um, I, I realized I haven't <laughs> even started really um, answering them, but I, I think it's, these are interesting questions to, to, to ponder and particularly this, the differences of, of scale and, um, the conclusions, if I had any, um, in some ways, there's some really positive experiences of religion in the history of, of Antarctica. Someone like Bird, who I didn't really have chance to, to get into, Wilson was drawing some beautiful landscape pictures inspired by um, sort of his, his religious um, background in, in the Antarctic. So this, this idea of thin places from Celtic Christianity I think applies really well in, in many people's experiences of the wilderness of Antarctica, but also important to acknowledge that religion and the environment is, is not always a, a neat positive story, that there are associations with geopolitics, there are associations with, with colonialism. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge um, where religion has been maybe misused in, um, 
its relationship with with the environment um, in places like like Antarctica as, as well. So a, a sort of using using Antarctica alongside contexts that we probably know much better in our home contexts, I think can give us this sort of cognitive dissonance, help us to see familiar questions in unfamiliar ways and hopefully help us to progress forward some of our ideas about how we can draw on um, this yeah, environmental theology and address many of the challenges that we're facing today. So I, I will turn off the screen share and have a look at the chat, but I think as Katie said, there aren't many people. So however you want to do this, Katie. Adrian, thank you so much. That was so interesting. I, I was having a look at the questions just to see if I could glean one, but if you would like to as well, that's that's totally fine. And if you want to hear people's voices, we could ask people to unmute themselves very briefly. It's, it, I mean, Mark, you've just written, is it all too remote for folk to associate with problems in their backyard? Which, which I would have happily heard in your voice. So sorry, I read that for you. Um, is that a good place to start? <laughs> Will we have two minutes, Adrian? That, yeah, that is a really good question. Um, and I think that there is a real danger of us choosing some privileged landscapes um, like, like the Antarctic and saying, we'll protect those at the same time as we, we trash the, the places we live. Um, there was a famous essay in environmental history written by William Cronin called The, the Problem or the, yeah, the Problem with Wilderness, um, The Trouble with Wilderness. And that, that makes that point that we, we, you, it shouldn't be somewhere out there. It's the environment is, is here with us wherever we are. Um, and so I, I wouldn't want to make that, that point at all, but I think thinking about places that are different can help us to maybe be better appreciate um, our own context, at least asking questions about those, those places that we might not ask otherwise. So yeah, a really good question. Um, and a, a danger, I think, not just with places like Antarctica, but with national parks or forests or sort of supposedly beautiful places. I wonder, this is a comment rather than a question, but um, I wonder if it maybe helps us connect the two as well, because I think, oh, Antarctica is so far away, it's got nothing to do with me. And then you show me pictures like that and say, if it all melts, then the sea level rises by 60 metres. And I think of all the places that I've lived and potentially live at the moment that would be underwater. And suddenly it connects somewhere that seems so far away because the consequences I mean, hopefully it's not all going to melt, but there, there will be some sea level rising, won't there? And so I feel like actually what you've just shown us, Adrian, with pictures of like, make it that, make it real, make it feel less remote and do bring the two together quite quickly, actually. Um, what would happen if we had increased floods? How would that affect the community garden in Bristol that you just shown us and that kind of thing? Yeah. yeah and I think just, I think, yeah, I, I fully agree with that, Maggie. That's, that's a really good point. And, and just the, the idea that, just us driving cars or putting putting pollution into the atmosphere has consequences the other side of the world um that that we don't so this sort of the, the idea of the the anthropocene in antarctica that in fact the industrial revolution had probably been changing the environment of antarctica before humans ever stepped on that continent um is a really sort of powerful and mind-blowing idea that that that's the scope of, of the things that we are we're doing to change the the world that we're living in. That's quite a striking place to leave it and it's bang on time. So um, I'm gonna press stop on record. I think Dora just asked about an author in the chat, Adrian. Um, I'm gonna go because I've got to be in a different 